Okay, so Mavis Staples, before she starts singing Eyes on the Prize uh, in her live album, Hope at the Hideout, says, We've come here tonight to bring you some joy, happiness, inspiration, and some positive vibrations. And we want to leave you enough to last you for the next six months. <laughs> and seeing your play was like that for me. Oh, I, bless you. It really was. It's like I've been hyped for like four months oh, straight. You just won my heart just by quoting Mavis Staples. Oh, my goodness. Well, How great. I was listening to the album recently, and I was like, that is what Hamilton is like. Like for me like it just gave me I don't know just like energy and hope and nourishment for just ever since I saw it oh, so it completely so blew me away and that's what great art I believe should do so it's been like this phenomenon in my life <laughs> anyway I'm gonna stop fangirling on you but um please don't no <laughs> okay I'll sustain it a little yeah. bit but we'll, so we'll we, were, we were doing this thing with the public theater and we were in New York for um, the great Oscar Eustace just... yes, yes and uh, for International Women's Day and so it just seemed perfect to talk to you about the play so thank you so much for Doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so, for those of us that aren't lucky enough to be in New York here to see the play, and it's almost impossible to get a ticket yes. at the moment, could you give us like a 30 seconds, like highlight reel synopsis? Yeah, sure. Um, Hamilton is the story of our first, our nation's first Treasury Secretary, and it's as sexy as it sounds. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation, every action's an act of creation. I'm laughing in the face of casualties of sorrow. I'm thinking past tomorrow. <laughs> it's about Alexander Hamilton. He's the dude on the $10 bill um, who had an amazing, tumultuous, unlikely American life. And I knew nothing about him until I picked up Ron Chernow's uh, biography of him one day on vacation and uh, just felt like it was the proto-American immigrant story. Before there was an America, this guy sort of came here for a better life and managed to make one. Um, it's also, uh, um, in a weird way, a love letter to writers. This is a yes. this is a guy who wrote his way out of his circumstances, wrote his way into power, and also wrote his way to ruin, blew up his own spot, um, yeah. and caught beef with all the other founding fathers. And and the music I use is. Um, all the music I can get my hands on. Yeah. So it's hip hop music and it's R and B music and it's Beatlesque esque music for King George. Yeah. Um, but it's um, our goal is to eliminate any distance between a contemporary audience and this story that happened over 200 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why people are so psyched. Uh, about Hamilton is that you just kind of blast through every expectation and tradition. You know, you use music that would be seemingly incongruous with the time, but that is so perfect as a way to express these ideas yeah. and like... And structurally, I steal a little bit from Harry Potter, I have to tell you. What? Because um, no. the opening scene, Hamilton meets Aaron Burr uh, and he says, Aaron Burr, like, help me, like, I want to be in this world. Uh, and Burr gives him the opposite advice of who he is, right. and then he meets his real friends, uh, yes. Mulligan, Lafayette, and uh, yeah, and right. uh, and Lawrence, and it's exactly. It's exactly, it's exactly Harry Potter meeting Malfoy yeah. first and then seeing his real friends on the train being I like, I like these guys better. I completely forgot that because in the first <laughs> book, Draco tries to be like, you know, I can help you. I can help you. Like, Just tries to befriend consort with him. the right people. And, and Harry has this instinctual, like, this guy is clearly an asshole yeah. and I have to. Yeah, everything I learned, I learned from, from those him. books. <laughs> yes! This is great. Harry Potter's everywhere. It's the yeah. ultimate universal story. Um, okay, good. So, yeah, so you wrote this play. Which is set how many years ago now? Uh, he was born in 1755. We go all the way through his set life. Set in 1755. In told with cont with contemporary music, with all different kinds of music. But it's also been kind of there's been this amazing response to it because you cast a multi-racial cast in the roles of you know who would traditionally yeah. have been white men. Um, so I'm really interested. You kind of really have broken the mold. Did, did this just kind of like flow naturally from you as a person and it an happened, artist or was this yeah, very Yeah, it happened conscious? very organically. You know, I got to this end of uh, the second chapter in this book. Um, I get to the part where he literally writes an essay and gets himself out of the Caribbean. Um, and I said, this is a hip hop story. So even in my first read through of the biography, I was casting hip hop and R&B artists in my head. I was never picturing the literal founding fathers. We know what they look like. Like, right. it takes exactly no research yes. to find out what the Founding Fathers actually look like. You just open your wallet. Right. Um, so the fun for me was in, all right, well, which 
R&B artist, hip hop artist, music artist has the feel of the, the temperament. So, you know, with George Washington, I was thinking about Common and I was thinking about John Legend. And that's a, actually a pretty good description of Chris Jackson who plays him um, with, uh, when I read the name Hercules Mulligan, I thought that's the most Busta Rhymesian sounding such rapper a name. name. It is like, such a great name. So good. So I, you know, I wrote it as if Busta Rhymes was in my head. And so Tommy Kale just sort of took that and extended Extended it and really said, you know, this this conceit just allows us to eliminate the distance even more because if it doesn't look like a John Trumbull painting mm -hmm. um, from the 1700s, then we can identify, we can find our way into it yeah. in a way that makes it much more accessible than if it was just sort of a you know a period piece. Totally. Well, again, that was what was so cool is that you know set hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but I kept seeing our times, topical issues that I was seeing in the news, right. just so reflected in what I was seeing yeah. on stage. And that's what I found in love with when I was writing it too. I was like, oh, we've been fighting about the same things forever. forever. It's no accident that we're still fighting about how much is the government involved in our lives, yes. which is what Jefferson and Hamilton rap battle about in my show. Yeah. It's no accident we still fight about how involved do we get in the other countries' uh, affairs, yes. which yes. is, you know, in our rap battle, it's the French, it's the French yeah, Revolution, the French Revolution, but is still just applicable to any any foreign venture uh, the United States has, um, and it's also no accident that. Um, Everyone who dies in our play dies as a result of gun violence. Yes. <laughs> That's the other thing that um, is it's is so is in the founding of our constitution that we can't seem to get right. Yeah. Um, but is you know plagues even our show, much less yeah. our country. Yeah, and also who's an American? Who gets to live here? Who's yeah. a true American? What does that What does that mean? Absolutely. Um, all of that stuff. I was so. I was like, wow, this has everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jefferson was using immigrant as a way of denigrating Hamilton way before Trump ever <laughs> entered ever the scene. Ever came anywhere near any of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. It was, it's so great. It's difficult for me, obviously, not to look at it through the lens of he for she and the work that I'm doing and, you know, Angelica and Eliza, uh, sorry, Angelica and Eliza and the, the sisters are, you know, clearly amazing for that. I'm trying to find, oh yeah. So she says, uh, Angelica raps, you want a revolution, I want a revelation. So listen to my declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And when I meet Thomas Jefferson, I uh. compel him to include women in the sequel. Work. It's so good. <laughs> I love it so I much. I just pictured a million teenagers see... making gifts of that moment. <laughs> me rapping? Yeah. Yes. Oh, God. It's the best. I am so <laughs> not a rapper, but it makes me want to learn to do it because she's so badass and it's she such is. an amazing way she to... Is. And she was. Express ideas. Yeah, and you know, I think um, one of the sort of the things that, that Ron writes about in his book that I sort of uh, expand in the show is this notion that if Angelica Schuyler lived in a different time, she'd be one of our founders. Totally. Um, and, you know, she meets everyone who met Hamilton and Angelica together thought, well, they're the married couple, right? Because yeah. they were so. Well, they, were, they were They were intellectual soulmates. Soul yeah. And the letters they write back and forth, I mean, he, you know, she's desperate for news. She's in London. Yeah. And she, she she married a rich British banker, moved to London, and her her letters she writes she actually also corresponded with Jefferson. Um, really? Yeah, and it's actually pretty amazing because Jefferson's trying to flirt with her and she's not having, having any it. Of it. He's like, you know, we should. He's in Paris while she's in London, and he's writing her this letter to the effect, if I'm paraphrasing, he's like, yeah, we should go to America together. We could like take the boat over together. And and, she's and Angelica like, goes, oh yeah, that sounds really nice, except there's uh, uh, I, my, my loyalties lie elsewhere. Basically, like she, yeah. oh she's God, like, like hashtag Team Hamilton. Hashtag I'm on somebody else's yeah. team. Uh, so she did meet Jefferson. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's so she's so cool. Um, so I'm interested though because you've like you've included these really really political things in your play and I'm interested do you think that storytellers have a responsibility to drive us forward as a society to encourage us to perceive things in new ways and if you do does this ever weigh like heavily on you do you ever feel like do you ever feel like that's a responsibility no I'll tell you the way I think of it I think 
storytellers can't help it. Your worldview affects what you see in the work and right. it affects what you make. Right. Um, anything that's political in Hamilton's story is inherent in Hamilton's story, at least the way I, I know how to tell it. Yeah. Um, and so I think the thing, you know, the, the notion of Hamilton as an immigrant story, it, it, maybe another writer would not have seized on that as the through line. That yeah. was definitely my way in. Yeah. Um, you know, having um, parents who were not immigrants, they were born in Puerto Rico. They came to New York. Um, you know, my dad didn't speak a word uh, of English when he came here and he came here to, to get a better life. So I, I'm familiar with that story, that right. immigrant narrative of like, we're going to come here and we're going to do the jobs no one else wants to do and we're going right. to work twice as hard. Right. Um, and I recognize that in Hamilton. Right. Um, so that's what comes out when I write him. Someone else may have a totally different version, but I really try not to think of writing as a burden at all. My job's to fall in love because it's got to sustain me. This show took six, seven years to write. It's got to sustain me yeah. for six, seven years. And so, um, you know, the, 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 politics inherent to the show are just what come out of me when I write about this thing. And, um, and it's also, but it's, it's really about being inspired and being in love. Like there are a million biopic, right. bio musical worthy subjects, yeah. but if I don't know the way to tell it, I can't tell it. So yeah. if it starts to feel like a responsibility and it feels like homework, I mean, I know you love homework. I, I love homework. I don't I love homework. homework. I need it to feel like a love affair. It yeah. can't feel like homework to me. No. Um, but that's sort of how I approach it. So kind of what you're saying is that art is is just incredibly personal. It's just like everyone will yeah. read the same thing a different way, will experience yeah. it differently. And, and I think the, the ultimate way in which art can be political is that I think it engenders empathy, which is the thing that politicians can't seem to they do. They can't do, yeah. it's, it's, oh, if you feel like you know someone because you've spent two hours chronicling their life in a story or you've seen some movie that gets you under their skin and in their heart like yeah. you can't dismiss them as other anymore no do you know you what can't. i mean it's you so true i talked about this yesterday when i was talking to forrest whisker just saying that like once you've seen a movie that has just opened you up to some to somebody else or in a different perspective you can't unsee it that's right that's it you're done that's you're right. changed forever you can't go back it's yeah. you're changed yeah. and that's what's so amazing about art and yeah. movies and plays and things. So, still on the topic of, of just awesome women-ness, um, Renee did this awesome rap, which I know that you co-wrote, uh, for the BET Hip Hop Awards oh, cipher. Was incredible? It was so good. Yeah, she's the um, best. So she said, I came to represent the ladies of our history. We know the founding fathers, but the mothers are a mystery. That's right. um, so, you know, in a new play, it's really interesting because Eliza chooses to erase herself from the narrative when she yeah. discovers uh, Alexander's affair. But a lot of women just have been erased from history. We're yeah. often, you know, you'll read quotes that's like anonymous. And normally that was a woman or we've seen so many women have to write under pseudonyms, under, under male names, even Joe Rowling, who wrote right. Harry Potter, insisted. Right. or Those great the, Cormoran Strike books, they're so good. I know, so good. Yeah. But, you know, said she wanted to be JK because there's so many kind of like... Ugh, yeah. irritating things that, that hold women back when they when they become a, a female writer or a right. women writer or, or whatever that even means. So, um, you know, I, I'm really interested. How do you think that women and men can reclaim women's history and the narratives and perspectives of women? And, and you did this in, in Hamilton. You essentially had to you had to create these stories for women because there's just less. Yeah, there's not a there's not a definitive Pulitzer winning Schuyler sisters biography. No. There isn't. We had to go. No. I had to go and, and yeah. do the research, and rely, I relied on Ron a lot. And um, um, you know, to me, the most moving, th one of the most moving things about Hamilton's story is that it is cradled by his wife's story. Yeah. She's the one who brings it to us. Yes. Um, and the last chapter of Ron's book is about her incredible life and, mm. and how much she accomplished establishing, she established the first um, private orphanage, uh, which was, uh, which still exists in the form of the Graham Wyndham organization, which yeah. helps uh, foster kids into adulthood um, and, um, and, and ran it for 27 years. And if you had put that in a screenplay, people would be like, it's too on the nose. Yeah, you yeah, can't yeah, have yeah. the widow of the orphan establish an orphanage. It's crazy, except it really happened. And it's heartbreaking and beautiful. Um, the other thing that's, that's really tragic is she really, you know, she had 
seven kids besides Philip who passed away. Wow. Um, and she really tried to get one of them to write her husband's life story. And she passed away uh, before it happened. Oh. Um, one of her sons eventually did complete it. Um, but I also feel for the kids. He left behind so much <laughs> writing. It's like, how do you begin to make sense of it? Um, wow. But, um, you know, she that was her thing was, please tell my husband's story. She was so selfless um, mm. in that way that, that women are so often asked to be um, yes. and so often assume as opposed to my story being told as yes. opposed to the woman's being st story yeah. being told. Um, but I, I found her story incredibly moving. That's why we end with her. Yeah, which is great. And it's so true, I think, there's this perception that women are inherently, biologically, right. more selfless and giving. And we just do that because we're women and that's how we are. Which is such a shame because... A, we don't get the credit that we deserve right. as human beings for being so courageous and doing that. Absolutely. And B, it just like it removes the decision. It removes the agency out of it. It, it takes the Absolutely. choice. Yeah, I feel really lucky. I, I grew up in a house with really strong women. My mom, um, my mom's a psychologist. Um, she was a teacher. She was getting her master's when I was born. And then she's a psychologist. And she was, you know, she had a private practice in our house. So it was like wow. mom's work. We have to sneak around the patients and like go home. Um, and uh, and my, my wife is, is the same way. My wife was a, a scientist when we started dating, wow. got bored of being a scientist, and then went to law school while Heights was happening. Now so she's done then. Yeah, she's, 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 just she's the brains of the outfit. Wow. Actually. Yeah, that's I'm, amazing. I'm slumming it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's so cool. So, yeah, so that's, I mean, I, I say that to say that like that, that thing of women are encouraging, or like that was never my experience experience as a kid. It was just, you know, they were just getting just, shit done. Just, just getting so much shit yeah, done. Yeah, that was just Wow, the thing. that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I love that you're married to like a scientist. That's super cool. Um, I told her to go right to med school from law school. Just like get the trifecta. Just why not? <laughs> yeah, because... just be the scientist lawyer doctor. Oh, wow. <laughs> she was like, the last one takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. That one takes forever. Um, okay, so speaking of awesome women, which... Storytellers, female storytellers, yeah. really have inspired you. Oh, so many. Um, you know, even in just the musical theater genre alone, there are so many incredible uh, examples. I think of my friend Janine Tesori, who's the uh, composer of Fun Home, um, uh, yes. which is an unbelievable show. If you haven't seen that, go see that. Yes, yes, go yes. Go see that. It was, part you... of our, it was part of our Heap She Asked Week. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, it's cool. and it's really, and in addition to just being an incredible, like, that's a story that you would think, People always go, oh, a musical about a founding father. Oh, a musical about a lesbian cartoonist. Like, no, it's actually the perfect form for it. And 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 she's the, you know, she and her her co-writer Lisa um, really unlocked that. So I, she's a huge. Um, She's one of my heroes. Um, and, um, you know, I think of Lizzie Suedos, who passed away, who is the composer, who, by the way, was writing hip hop in 1978 for Broadway wow. with a musical called Runaways, which she wrote all the music, lyrics, books, and directed. Um, wow. And uh, so she's, she's one of my big heroes in the theater scene. Um, and then, you know, I think of God. I mean, I'm thinking of all, like, the young authors growing up. Like, I'm thinking of Beverly Cleary, and I'm thinking of Madeline Langle, and I'm thinking of, um, you know, uh, Judy Bloom and I'm thinking of all these incredible uh, and JK of course, of course. Um, the women who raised my brain yes. um, because those were my books those were just my books growing up that's awesome that's awesome uh, so yeah speaking of books and you know uh, things that changed your brain uh, it's impossible for me to look over the fact that Hamilton focuses so much on the importance of education yeah. um teaching yourself, the power of education, the power of writing. Was this something that really drew you to Hamilton? Yeah, absolutely. It? It's, it's, it's very much a love letter to writers and, yeah. um, and being able to really change your life with writing. Um, that's what Hamilton did. Yeah. Um, he, one of the first letters we have is a letter to his friend, Ned Stevens. He's 14 years old and he's talking about, um, how miserable he is. He's working for a trading company. He's basically running a trading company, um, because the owners are on ships. They're, they're sailing around. And, um, he says, um, uh, you know, I may be said to be building castles in the air, but we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. Um, I shall conclude. <laughs> 
me? This is like, this was a huge problem watching your play. It's just that, like, <laughs> words just like get me. It's like, yeah. Uh, I mean, we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. I mean, knock me out. And, and then he says, I have it. Whoa, 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 rewind. How old are you hearing? 14 years old. No, this yes. isn't fair. 14 years old. 14? Yeah. And then he so says, like He's like a, pro- yeah, he's he's a prodigy. Like a genius. Yeah. He's like a prodigy. And, and, and literally wrote his way out. And he concludes that letter by saying, I shall conclude by saying that I wish there was a war. Um, because he knew he didn't have money and he didn't yeah. have family. He knew the only way for him to rise in society was to gain military glory. Was for things to get mixed up. Yeah, yeah. things to get mixed up and for him to be able to, but also like the, the, the valor, the sort of acclaim that comes with winning a military victory. He said, I'll either die virtuously on the battlefield. And I think he had a lot of teen martyrdom fantasies about that. Right. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I'll, I'll, I'll have had a command and I can, I can rise up. And the whole time he's working for him, for Washington, He's like, I don't want to be your secretary. I want to be fighting. Like he's he's the only one on like uh, you know best job at the war. Like not fighting, writing, doing the thing he's best at. And he's like, please let me fight. Please let me fight. Please let me fight. Please let me fight. So interesting. And yeah. do you think that's because there's this idea around like, as a man, that's just like the ultimate glory. Even though he he clearly has the most amazing brain of anyone ever. Yeah. Ultimately, being being a fighter is like yeah i think he was he was accustomed to that but i think he really understood i think it was his i think his survival like instinct instinct was was super crazy good good, and he was just like if i leave here just having been a secretary that doesn't get me anything i don't have anything and do you think that's also the idea of sacrifice of what he was sort of of the idea of yeah, of sacrifice of what, of what yes, he was willing I think to do he for was, his country, I think and then he wanted to show how much he was willing to die for his beliefs, to die for this idea. Absolutely, and you see that borne out again and again. You see him take on unpopular opinions. You see him take on other popular. You know, yeah. it's all about being the crusader. He's a crusader. Yes. yes. Um, whether it's with himself during the war or with yes. it's his his ideas um, when he's defending the Constitution, um, whether he's fighting with Jefferson over what the government should yeah. do. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I'm right. Yeah. And I, you know, um, one of the first letters he, he, he has a letter to John Lawrence where he says, um, he's, he's talking about, uh, he says, I need you to find me a wife. And it's kind of a crazy letter. He goes, I need you to find me a wife. Um, she should be pretty, but not too pretty. Um, it's very like bro. It's a very bro letter. Bro-y letter. Yeah. He goes, she needs to be pretty, not, not too pretty that I have to like worry about it. Um, <laughs> basically oh I'm paraphrasing. And then he says, and as to her political opinions, it doesn't matter what they are. I will convince her to mine. This is Hamilton who says this. This is Hamilton who oh, says this. Oh, I'm liking less now. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Oh, but that's damn. a real letter. Oh, yeah, but that also so, speaks to his so arrogance. I was so seduced. You were seduced only by only schemes. Moments ago, yeah. Your fave is problematic. So well, and now... They're all problematic. I know. People are problematic. <laughs> yeah. That's the difficulty. It's true. So, okay. So basically, because he was just so focused on his political aspirations, he kind of just needed a wife who he could just like... Well, he also said, he also said, I need her to have money because I don't have any. That was another thing he said in the letter. <laughs> oh my god. Well, actually, I mean, I guess in a way, it's a, it's kind of a gender reversal in the sense that we always think it's, you know, a woman at that period of time yes. who would have been looking to marry a wealthy man. That's true. Whereas this is kind of the inverse of that. Yes. Um, yeah, and he writes her actually really hard. There's the, one of the last letters before they get married is this very... I might win you back with this okay, one. Oh, really? Um, oh, he basically do, says... The, the, there's a lyric in the so show, much. Will You Relish Being a Poor Man's Wife? That's from this letter. He says, do you soberly relish the pleasure of being a poor, poor man's, man's wife? wife? And he basically says, if you marry me, like, it might, like you might be we really broke. You yeah. come from money. And, like, and he says, like, don't have any illusions of like being in a field with garlands in your hair. Like, that's not what being broke is like. No. Being broke sucks. It's horrible. Um, and it's if you're prepared romantic. to live that life... Yeah then we can get married because I think I'm going to do great. <laughs> and like then that. you'll just be happily surprised I if like we that. end up having money. But he said, he like, he like really preps her. He's like, well, he doesn't try and con her. He doesn't really try like. to con her. He, he really like, it's, it's a very, you know, there's the arrogant letter to Lawrence, which is like, get me a wife. And then there's this letter, which is like, don't marry me because if you don't think you can be happy poor, yeah, you know, so it's that bedrock of arrogance and insecurity that I think makes him so, I think it makes him so relatable. He's, on, in one minute, he's like, I'll convince her. Yeah. And one minute, he's like, do you like me for real, though? Yeah, do you really like me for real? Yeah. yeah, no, I think Hamilton's most compelling moments for me are always these moments when he's, when he makes 
decisions to courageously be authentic and truthful, yes. um, even though it costs him. Yes. And, and even though that letter could have cost him Eliza, potentially. Right. She could have been like, oh, I thought you were poor, but not that poor. <laughs> um, actually, maybe I'm not so into this anymore. Yeah, so did did Hamilton just like read everything he get his hands on? Yes. That's how he he self educated. Yeah, he, he, he self educated. He, he, um, he had um, he actually had a, a teacher on the island. I'm fuzzy on it because I haven't read it in so long. Um, but he actually went to a Hebrew school uh, on the <laughs> island, um, and uh, so he um, so that was some of his early education on the island. Then he came here um, with the hopes of being a doctor. Um, he applied to uh, what would become Princeton, um, and but asked to like accelerate his studies, and they right. said no. No. Right. Um, that's what we reference in that opening yeah. song. Yeah. Um, and and Burr actually did go through Princeton in like two years when he was like 13 years old. But his dad was president of Princeton. So it's going to be helpful. <laughs> Again, in that. Malfoy. Yes. <laughs> um, but Seriously. so he went to a school that would allow him to study faster because he also felt behind. He sort of like landed right. he here behind. So he was like, can I, up, up, I'm, I'm smart. Up. I'm smart. I'm sorry. Can I graduate faster? Please? Yeah. 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 Let me just get this over with. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, but um, but the, the importance of, of of education is it was so key for him. Even during the war, he's reading books on monetary policy in the event that we win the war. Because one of the things he learned, and this was actually a song I cut uh, from the show, there was a song called Valley Forge I cut where he just talks about how their money's worthless because um, the British money is worth something and America bucks aren't a oh, thing yeah. because they're colonies. Yeah. And so the irony of them fighting for American independence while the British soldiers can afford supplies and food and lodging and the Americans can't right. um, because their money's worthless. So um, I, I, it hurt me to cut that song for the simple reason that monetary policy is not an abstract thing for Hamilton. He almost died. Um, they almost starved to death. There were untold um, American casualties that winter because they were starving and they were freezing. It wasn't because of fighting. No one was fighting. Right. They were just was, dying. Yeah. Because they they were just in a field freezing to death. Um, and so, um, so having money that's worth something is actually a life or death thing in his brain. Yeah. Um, so when Jefferson is like this pamphlet, this what is, thing's too cares? long. Yeah, who, <laughs> who cares, cares about financial We just want to be farmers and so he's like, boring. you will care. <laughs> you will care because you, yeah, it might yeah. mean that you make it or you don't. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so to switch topics slightly. So, you know, obviously you've been asked by lots of different members of the media and journalists about, um, gender blind casting for yeah. Hamilton. Um, and you've said that you'd be, that you'd be down, um, other than that it'd be difficult to change some of the vocal ranges yeah. on some of the songs, yeah. but conceptually you yeah. like the idea. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think there's going to be so many lady Hamiltons once this thing is in schools and in regional productions. Um, and that's great. Like, again, I, I do theater because I fell in love with being in the school play in high school. Yeah. And I also remember um, the inherent unfairness. I remember directing West Side Story and girls trying out in a nine to one ratio and being like, this yeah. sucks. Yeah. This sucks that like there's two great girl parts. And uh, I mean, it. this show's a masterpiece and that's why I'm directing it, but like this sucks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when. Heights started getting released to school groups, and I started meeting people from all girls' schools who were like, I was Usna, like girls being like, I was Usnavi. I mean, like, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so, so that's going to go gender blind into the world um, because, you know, we want this to be the best school play ever. Yeah. Um, and um, we want the people who want to do it to do it. Yes. And, and, and the other thing that I, I, I kind of continue to think about, um, and I have time to think about it, is finding ways to take the sort of really color conscious casting we've done and extend that into the school life because it's so easy it's so easy for a drama teacher to sort of just cast the kids who always audition which is which aren't always the kids of color at school yeah because there aren't parts for them and so they think why am i gonna why be my fair lady you? yeah you know what i mean oh i'm interested so I, I didn't know this about you i was researching for this interview you worked on west side story mm -hmm. you translated it into spanish yeah i translated the sharks into spanish yeah, that was pretty fun, That's and so and cool. I wouldn't have done it if it the original creators weren't involved. It was Arthur right. Lawrence, it was Sondheim, yeah, Arthur Lawrence and Sondheim, and that was is, it was Lawrence's pitch. He was very passionate about it, um, right. and so it was it was fun, but it was interesting. Like the. Um, it only worked so well in terms of audiences. You know, I always think of I think West Side Story as 
kind of the best musical. Like it really yeah. is like no, it's amazing. it's the most perfect synthesis of music and lyric and dance all sort of coalescing. And so I thought audiences will just go with us because they know how I feel pretty goes in English. So yeah. what is it like if it's in Spanish? But there was a lot of pushback. Um, really? Yeah. And, and, and the producers actually put back a lot of the English that I had translated uh, because it's one thing, you know, within the Heights, we don't think twice about it yeah. to go back and forth between Spanish and English because it was built into it originally. Right. But messing with a classic comes with its own sort of pitfalls. And so people really yeah. pushed back. There were people who really liked it. And there were people who were like, can you just sing I Feel Pretty? Like, I love I, I Feel like, Pretty. Yeah, I <laughs> so I, I, I sort of learned the lesson of like messing with a classic, even though I had the blessing and was working with right. sort of the creators of the thing. Right. It was um, it was an oh, interesting, interesting experience. Um, so you watched the story. You worked on In the Heights, which I absolutely loved that musical too. Oh, um, yes, and you just wrote music for the new Star Wars. So you work, you've worked yeah. on so many different kinds of things, and I'm I'm interested when I when I look at those pieces that you've dabbled in as a theme, like masculinity and what that what that really means seems to be seems to connect a lot of the pieces. Oh, that's um, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. <laughs> look, at um, that. look at that. Oh, I love it. I'm t telling Lynn Manuel something new about his work. That makes me <laughs> super happy. Um, so I'm interested with within different cultures, do you see like perceptions of masculinity and what being a man should be? Do you yeah. see it differently within different cultures? And sometimes, it's, and sometimes cultures? it's funny what they are. Like, I remember, you know, I was. Um, I was a vegetarian until I was about 13 years no old. Way. Um, not for vegetarian. any political reasons. No. Um, I just, it didn't was a like tactile it. thing. I didn't like the feel of chicken. I didn't like the feel of, I just didn't like it. And so I, my parents both ate meat and they were like, all right, we got to get protein in you another way. And so I ate a lot of eggs, which I didn't mind. And I ate a lot of fish sticks covered in ketchup, I guess. Um, but then puberty hit and like a switch flipped and I went, oh, meat, meat's great. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know what happened. It was really biological, but I will tell you my very old school Puerto Rican grandfather kind of looked at me like, like my whole childhood was like, she doesn't eat meat. He's I'm not worried a real about man. He's not a real man. Like I'm worried about him and he doesn't eat meat. That somehow was the marker of it's manhood. Interesting <laughs> and then I, I started eating meat. I had my first filet of mignon with him at the Ponderosa Steakhouse in Puerto Rico. And he was like, oh. And you got male approval. Yes. You, you got to sit in yeah, a man I was box. Like, what the hell does meat have to do with anything? Um, but in Puerto in Rican culture, culture, I learned <laughs> as a child, right, man, you're you know, meat you're equals man. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's like right. one weird sort of quirky one that I experienced firsthand. That's really uh, interesting because I have guy friends who are very environmentally conscious and there's so much talk at the moment right now about the fact that red meat um, is such a big contributor to greenhouse gas. Yeah, it's like the number one bigger yeah. than anything else. So if we just ate less red meat, we would instantly kind of reduce, reduce emissions. But for him, even though he's like super into this stuff, he's like, I just, like, I'm a man. I eat red, red meat. I can't, I can't divorce. I've the never two. understood the meat man. Me neither. It's very confusing. I know a like, lot of ladies who really like meat. Yeah, it's just delicious. Yeah, and like it's so funny that that's become a thing. I don't know what that's a holdover from, but Maybe, it's a thing. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so that's... And then thing. also, you know, the other thing is, like, I'm a straight guy who writes musicals, yes. um, which is... Oh, that's interesting. Do people think that you have to be gay to write a musical? Uh, is that like, have you ever yes, had that? Yes, I, I, it's a... Yeah, it's a little bit like being a white NBA player. Um, I, I'm not sure why that is. One, boys who like girls, you're missing out if you don't audition for the school play. There's lots of girls at the school play. Also, boys who like boys, also audition for the school play. Yes, everyone <laughs> Everyone should audition for the school play. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, to me, um, that's what sort of changed my life and made me figure out who I am for many reasons. I think when you're in high school, there's so much live or die drama in your grade. Yes. Like, oh, this person likes this person, this person's not talking to this person, and it feels like the most high stakes oh, stuff in the world. And that's Everything. only been intensified by social media. Yeah. And for me, doing the school play meant I had friends in other grades. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's getting a little, temperature's getting a little high in my hallway. I'm going to go hang out with my friends who are seniors who were in the play. And you have a little heartbreak when your friends graduate before you do, but you yes. also, um, it, it also gives you perspective on yeah. school in a way that lets you sit outside it. That's so true. My, my favorite experience from being at Brown was I did a student production of Chekhov's Three Sisters. Oh, fantastic. And it was like, 
you form such different friendships and relationships with people that Absolutely. you have to be vulnerable with like that and put yourself out there and like yeah. those friendships in that period of time was, was yeah no it meant the most to me when heights started getting done by high schools because I was like oh there's a generation of people who got their first yeah. kisses, Benny and Nina. There's yes. a generation of salon ladies who are going to be best friends for life. Forever. Because because like, of this. Yeah. And that's, that's really, like, by doing it is really, that's how I fell in love with theater. It's, it's by, by doing it. Yeah, totally. Um, I have to talk about the moment in the play that just destroyed me. Okay. I mean, I was like, just, just could not stop crying. I was such a mess. So it was Dear Theodosia, which is where two men sit on stage and sing essentially this incredibly tender love song to their children. And yeah. they talk about what being a father means to them, how it was so much more than or beyond what they had even expected. And um, I guess in the midst of all, this, all the politics and the bloodshed and whatever else, this just really felt like the heart of the play for me. Yeah. Um, and it felt like a very unusual portrayal. I feel like I very rarely see men in plays and in movies talk emotionally yeah. about what being a father like means to right. them. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's compounded by the fact that neither of these men grew up with their fathers. Right. You know, yeah. so it's these guys. You know, to me, the line that kind of wrecked me while I was writing was my father wasn't around oh, I swear that I'll be around for you it kills me because that's that's tr whether you have whether you grew up with your parents or not um, I think you so you aim to fix you aim to make you you aim to fix whatever your childhood wasn't, wasn't and you make mistakes of your own and you're, you're destined to it's just what's going to happen yeah and and so that notion of I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do my best is, yeah. you know, that is, um, that's what broke my heart in the writing of that. That was yeah. sort of finding, um, you know, I, I found my way to that song because I realized both these guys had kids at the same time and both these guys don't have a, a father to relate their experience to. Right. Um, and so that was immensely, it also, you know, it came at a very weird time in my life. I wrote that song. People always go, oh, you wrote that song for your child. No, I wrote that song three years before really? I had a kid. Um, I was, it, it, you know, sometimes there's just those weeks where everything in your life changes. Um, I've never told this story before. I was, uh, I was on vacation in the Dominican Republic. I was with my wife's family. Um, my wife's aunt um, was in the final stages of ALS, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, incurable and uh, so far. And uh, we were just kind of waiting for the news to hit. She lives in Austria. And, um, and so it was a vacation, but it was also we had this news that was coming, hanging over us. Right. And so our fa the family was very tense and trying to make the best out of a vacation. At the same time all this happened, um, this tiny stray puppy jumped on my wife's beach chair, licked her ankle, and gave her these pleading eyes. My wife is a lifelong cat person and like changed teens oh. in that moment. Oh no! And it was like, oh no. Oh, oh no. Oh no, I really want yeah. a puppy. Oh, I, I want this puppy. And, she, and we said, all right, well, if it comes back tomorrow, it's ours. Because it played with us all day, followed us around all day. Let it go. Came back with a sister. Oh, no. Oh, no. So now <laughs> Next you day, to... that day, uh, Vanessa's aunt passes away. Um, Vanessa's, you know, we're all distraught and we're crying. And, you know, Vanessa's mother, who has just lost her sister, and we have these two sister puppies that we're taking care of. Mm. Um, and we're like, well, we, they're coming home with us. Um, and so we, we, we brought the, the, the puppies home. We found a home for the sister. We kept uh, Toby, which is Spanish for ankle. Um, oh. Um, and uh, and in that week, I wrote Dear Theodosia. It was like the calm in my life. Like my life was a st weird storm, and that was the calm in my life. Was going to like these men and writing this like love song. This so love people song. go, "Oh, your child." I go, oh, "Yeah, my dog." I was about to <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I, yeah. yeah. Isn't it so much the case that yeah. our animals are our train, training ground for... Uh, Hold yeah. Um, I, I need to ask you some questions before we run out of time. Okay, fine. Um, so um, I'm aware that this might be on the internet. And the number one question I get asked, um, because the fandom is real, is um, we have to sort the founders into uh, Hogwarts houses. Okay, because obviously I'm Hermione and I like, had to... <laughs> I have it on paper. All your questions being solved, kids. You can thank me on the Twitter. Okay, so I, it was very difficult for me to sort Eliza and Angelica. Okay. And I 
And by the way, none of this, like, half this, half this. No, no, no. Like, if you're doing that, you're cheating. You have to live in one house. It's true. You can't live in two houses. One house. So... I had initially put Eliza in Ravenclaw and Angelica in Gryffindor, and then I decided to switch them. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I think Eliza would be Gryffindor, uh -huh. and I think Angelica would be Ravenclaw. And Angelica for Ravenclaw because that. she's just she's all brain. She's she really she makes that decision about Hamilton. She assesses the situation. She decides to do the smart thing rather than follow her heart. Yeah. Whereas Angelica, to me, just feels like all heart, all yeah. courage. So that was that was why I did that. Awesome. Who else you got? I've got Aaron, <laughs> I've got Aaron Burr, it down. who is Aaron Burr, who is obviously Slytherin. Um, just all ambition. When you reply to this on Twitter, please just put the gif of her raising her hand. In the movie. <laughs> that would be the appropriate. Thing. That would be the appropriate thing. Call me, me. I have the answers. Um, I know. Uh, yeah. So Aaron Burr, Slytherin. Um, you know, East Switzerland. Just wait, waiting, you, waiting on the sidelines. You said there was a case to be made. There was a case to be made. Made. There was a case to be made for Hufflepuff. And there's a case. There's a case because I feel like as a young man, if Aaron, Aaron, Aaron could have grown or developed or like he could have, but he kind of, yeah, he could have developed, but he didn't. So Slytherin. Um, he could have gone. He could have gone in Hufflepuff's direction, but didn't. Hamilton. Uh, Gryffindor. Yeah. For me, he's all authenticity, all courage, all authenticity. And I will tell you, the, the one thing that backs your argument, yes. and I now will tell you what your co-star said, which was different, um, was uh, that in uh, as a soldier, his nickname was the Little Lion, which there is, you, you know, the Gryffindor. Uh, this makes perfect sense. Yeah, but I asked Daniel Radcliffe when he came to the show, I said, so please sort uh, Hamilton into a house. And he went, Ravenclaw, definitely. Why though? Like that quickly. But why? I don't know. I'm going to have to said... call him about this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask him that. Okay. Well, I have to ask, I have to ask you two very quick things. Okay. One quick thing. My One of my favorite lines in the play is when you, is when, is when Hamilton says to Aaron Burr, speaking of Slytherin, if you don't stand for something, what will you fall for? Yeah. And I just love that because it's so emblematic of the idea that be on the sidelines is a decision. It's not like you can just, right. because it allows, even if what's happening around you isn't in line with your personal beliefs, by not actively standing against it, you're allowing those things yeah. to continue. Yeah, I, um, I remember I, I, uh, for Martin Luther King's uh, birthday this year, I was asked uh, to read a speech, uh, and there was a quote that has been resonating with me um, even today, which is, there is such a thing as being too late. Yes, you know, there and, is. you know, and that that is um, that's something that's really true, and that's something that you know we play with with Hamilton and Burr, mm. you know, in terms of when do you act, when do you keep your opinions to yourself? Yeah, when um, you keep your cards close to your yeah. chest. Hamilton couldn't help himself. He couldn't. And, and he wears his heart on his sleeve, yeah. like I do. Where yeah. I had and, and the tragedy that. in the way we tell it is the time Burr acts and Hamilton doesn't, one kills the other. You know, it's yeah. they, they don't they're not static over the course no. of the show. They change. Like Burr becomes more in his expression for power and his expression for um political mobility. Yeah. He becomes more Hamiltonian yeah. and Hamilton through tragedy yeah. sort of retreats. Yeah. Do you see yourself in Hamilton? Do you I see myself in all in... of them. Yeah. I see myself uh in Angelica. Um it was great fun being Angelica. I mean the fun of writing is you get to be all of you them. You get to be everyone. Um you, get to be all the you know, uh some of these songs uh you know, that would be enough. <laughs> I'll tell you another very personal story. The uh I wrote that song probably the fastest song I wrote for the show. I wrote it in 45 minutes. It just, Eliza needed to say it. I had another song I was trying to write, and then I was like, oh, Eliza needs to say this now. And I, I wrote that song, and I played it for my wife. Oh. Tears running down my face. Oh. And, I, and she looked at me because she is not in the business, and she goes, oh, is that what you wish I would say to you? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you wish it's I would say, say to you? And I go, no, it's what I say to you. I mean, it's oh. it's actually my letter to her. Um, oh. You know, so he for she. Okay, that's amazing. Um, Everyone should read the lyrics to that song. Um, okay. But yeah, it, that's actually my love letter to my wife. That's 
that makes me <laughs> like you a lot. Um, that's great. Um, I'm gonna go listen to that after this and like just cry. Um, <laughs> so other than this, I have to ask. You're an amazing freestyler. Yes. You're, you can just do this. And you're an amazing beatboxer. This is great. He's lying. <laughs> He's lying. I'm okay. Well, what, what, what I said was, I'm happy to freestyle, freestyle if you beatbox. Freestyle if I beatbox. Okay, but show me how. What am I doing? Okay, just, well, well, first let's just see. No instruction. Oh, no. Just from what you've seen. I know you've seen a this lot of beatboxing. Bad, I'm yeah. sure they were beatboxing on set during those movies. Every young man tries oh, yeah. it. English school a lot kids, of young that's what we do it. all the time. Yeah. We just, we just beatbox. Right. Um, <laughs> okay, this is going to be so bad. It's going to be cover, awesome. Do I cover my mouth? Yeah, is just for my sake. Yeah. Do I do this just so I don't spit at you? Yeah, yeah, okay, it's great. sort of like the spit guard. This is gonna be so embarrassing. Okay. okay, what am I freestyling about? Gender equality. Fantastic. It's here. It's okay. International Women's Day. It's he for she. Yeah. In gender equality, feminism. Are you a feminist? Yeah, absolutely. Love that. Great. Yeah. We, okay. Okay, back to this. We can talk to this. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk in a minute. Okay, so what kind of beat do you want? Slow or fast? Uh, whatever you got. This is gonna be bad. Okay. This is gonna be amazing. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Yo, it's Lynn, and I have to laugh. How can we need not be equal? We're like half. Like women are like half of the people on earth. And yes, they should have been uh, equal since birth. That means all day, every day, equal pay, every way. Okay, are we really okay? Oh my gosh. Yo, this beatbox is fantastic. Beast, where to find them? Yo, I'm drastically changing the narrative. Look at it. You kept going. And oh my gosh, I love watching this keep flowing. Holy cow. This is such a meme. Thank you. This is the beatbox dream team. I'm so <laughs> embarrassed right now. Wait I'm that. literally the color of like a tomato. <laughs> I'm so best. red. That was amazing. Oh my thank gosh, you, thank, thank, you thank you for having thank me. Thank you. That was the best ever. Yeah. Please. Oh, love you. Thank you. Beatboxing. Everyone go see the play. And no one ever asked me to do that ever again. <laughs> These are the links that I will go to for gender equality.